Okay, Eric is gone, ladies and gentlemen. I'm here. I'm Will. I don't know where Eric went, but it's Block Talk Radio. It's the Wrestling Roundtable. I say we just do what we do. You know, I think we're all small guys. We all do the show until, uh, you know, Eric's figure out what uh, the technical problem is. Yep, so I guess I am the substitute host. I am Will here, here for the Wrestling Roundtable. I'm here with Rodney and Will Brooks. Say hello, guys. How's it going? Hello, oh, yeah. All right, so we've been gone for a while. I know... Eric's been working very hard on the wrestling uh, diaries. He's done a great job. Uh, we're finally back in 2011. Brand new year for the Wrestling Roundtable. I know Eric was going to be talking about UFC. Hate to cut you guys off, but I am back in. What a great way to start off the new year. Phone goes out right before we go on the air. But I am here. Thank you, Will, for introducing the show. But I am doing the introductions now properly. As the host, I am Eric Santa Maria, host of Wrestling Roundtable Radio. The number to call in is 347-857-4647. We want to hear your thoughts and opinions on the latest goings-on in pro wrestling and mixed martial arts. We will be talking about both tonight and lots of ground to cover. But before we get down to business on the latest shows and latest happenings, I want to remind you to go to WrestlingRoundtable.com. I know some of you who watch us on YouTube. And speaking of where you're watching and or listening to us, we are live not only on Blog Talk Radio, as we have been all year. This is our 20th show starting off 2011. Happy New Year. The 20th show is also being simulcast for the first time on GoFight Live. So a big thank you to our partners over at GoFight Live for playing Wrestling Roundtable Radio there as well. However, if you want to stream live this radio show on your blog, on your website, you can get the HTML to embed that on our Blog Talk radio site. So check our account over there. You can get the links to all of our sites, Facebook, and we're over there too. But we're also on Twitter and iTunes. You can go to WrestlingRoundTablePodcast.com. Our entire archive is over there, thanks to Mr. Will Vafides. That includes... Every show, I said every show, that includes the ones that are not available anymore from the first season in video form. You can still listen to the content on iTunes in our podcast form, WrestlingRoundTablePodcast.com, which includes the band episode where I had the gall to imply that Jeff Hardy was a cokehead. <laughs> what was I thinking? Actually, now that I do think about it, since he's on trial, uh, don't you think that WWE should just uh, unflag that video that they flagged a couple years ago because of that? I think it's only fair. After all, we all know they were covering up now, but uh, that's neither here nor there. Either way, you can still listen to that show on iTunes. Of course, we also have our shows in full on Go Fight Live on YouTube. If you're listening to us on YouTube, incidentally, you're not listening to us live, which I hope you do on Blog Talk Radio or Go Fight Live. But, like I'm trying to get across, there's always content and there's always ways to listen to us. We're not going anywhere. We're only going up. WrestlingRoundTable.com. What I was trying to get to here is that some of you who listen to us primarily on YouTube, and we appreciate all your views and your comments, however, we want you to come over to WrestlingRoundTable.com also because the show never dies. Even though we are still on our seasonal break, and we will be coming back shortly, probably within the next few weeks or so, but more on that later. Some of you seem to have dropped off in that time, but I'm just trying to get across to you that you shouldn't, because we always have content. And to start off the year, a lot of work, people. We had our biggest site update ever. It included... Bill of Mania running wild. <laughs> Bill Treadway has gone just fucking apeshit all over WrestlingRoundTable.com. So much writing this guy does, and we appreciate it so much. He's reviewing every Raw, every pay-per-view, WWE or TNA, shows he's gone to, old shows that he's written about, DVDs. He just wrote about the Starcade Essential Collection. He's going to be reviewing every WrestleMania building up to this year's WrestleMania. That's 26 whole shows, people. 
Lots of recaps, but he's not alone. Zach Fellows out of the UK is pretty much Mr. Smackdown here on the website. If you read his latest review of this past Friday's show, you read about the formation of the Nexus Wolfpack, as I like to call it. But he also did the SmackDown 10th Anniversary DVD. But those two are not alone. Some of you, thankfully, have taken us up on the offer. We are trying to constantly get it across to everyone that this is your show, too. Not just the panelists here, but your show, too. And they've been submitting guest columns. Enzinwa out of New York has been putting up a lot of his old stuff. And it's really interesting to read now. Certainly the Matt Hardy one in retrospect, very interesting. But also guest reviews and recaps. Someone just did WWF's Greatest Superstars of the 90s. We'll be talking about the 90s later on. And the first in your house, which also had it in the new generation time period. Also recaps of SmackDown, updating the polls. We'll re- read some poll results later. The archives of Raw and pay-per-views, so much content, including the news. And we're not done yet. There's going to be more site updates coming soon. So, point being, be a part of the Wrestling Roundtable community. This is your show, too. Share, comment, rate, and subscribe wherever you are listening to us or watching. And now that that's out of the way, let's do some proper introductions. I guess let's call him co-host for the night, Mr. Will Vafides. Hello, Will. Hello, everybody. It was nice to get to do a little opening. I can't do it like you again because you're obviously a professional at this. Uh, <laughs> great to be back on the round table. Remember I also go to the Amazon store. I've been bu- All Christmas I've been buying from that store. I'm sure Eric saw his bank account go, like, amazingly high. <laughs> That's right. We also want to emphasize that there are links everywhere on WrestlingRoundTable.com. You see a picture, it probably leads you somewhere. But we also have the Amazon store if you want to support our show. If you're going to get anything on Amazon, you can get it through our store, and we get a cut of it. You can also shop at our store, which has the Wrestling Round Table t-shirt. Wear it to the next Raw. Wear it to the next, well, in your case, Will, you're going to the Royal Rumble. In Absolutely. It's Boston, a 40, aren't you? It's a 40-man Rumble, not a 30-man. So I am a part of history, TLDWrestling.com, by the way. Yes, also TLDWrestling.com. Will Brooks, welcome to the show. Hello. Hey, how you doing, Eric? Doing okay now that the phone's working again. Also wanted to bring on Rodney LeCon. Hey, yo, Rod. Hey, yo, Eric and listeners, what's going on? Well, now that I have you on, Rod, I wanted to mention some fans that I ran into this weekend in Charlotte. Wanted to mention Vic and Brendan, who is with In Your Head Radio. And he asked me about that quote, MMA documentary we were doing, and I think we all know what he meant. <laughs> he meant the Grappling Kings, so now that he asked that question and I have you here, I'm throwing it out to you. What's the latest on the Grappling Kings? Well, a lot of the videography work and other things have taken up my time this past year, and uh, of course, you know, it's my computers on everything, but I am, this is the first time that I will make a promise that the 2011 Grappling Kings will come out, it will be very good, I'm very confident and all the footage I got, and my vision for it, and I'm guaranteeing that whatever theater that it premieres in, I will fill it up. That's a guarantee. No (laughs) one will leave disappointed. We also want to keep in mind that we have a newsletter going around, mostly put together by Jason Alito, but yesterday I put a special one. Actually, it was this morning. I put a special edition out there for our subscribers with exclusive news, as usual, and an exclusive message. And you can sign up for that at WrestlingRoundTable.com, as well as our message board and chat room. You can chat during the show, or if you're watching Raw, Will Brooks will be there every Monday night. And... Lots of ways to interact with the panel and other fans, but since that has passed, I guess I can let the cat out of the bag a little bit. Part of that exclusive news, now that we're mentioning documentaries, was The Wrestling Road Diaries is finished. It is complete. At this point, it's out of my hands as far as the duplication and the uh, DVD making process, Uh, but the edit, the cut is done. So hopefully that will be out sometime soon. 
Uh, I don't know if we're going to make the January release that I was hoping for, but if not, then certainly early February, but that will be out shortly, thankfully, at long last, and we will keep you updated at WrestlingRoundTable.com. So, to get down into what we were planning on talking about, mixed martial arts first, UFC 125 on New Year's Day from the MGM Grand in Las Vegas, Nevada. I was there for this event. Wanted to have a good New Year's. Definitely a good start off to 2011, although, Rodney, it was a fuck of a lot colder out there than I thought it would be. When we were flying uh, to Vegas over the desert and we're starting to make our descent, the captain gets on the speaker and he goes, All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're making our descent into Las Vegas and the temperature is 35 degrees. I said, What? 35 degrees? Get the fuck out of here. I thought, well, it's the desert. Last I went out there, it was July 2009 for UFC 100. Not a cloud in the sky, just the sun beating down on us nonstop. And I had been out there in about around October time a few years ago, and it was pretty good out there, maybe about 70-something. I didn't think it'd be this cold. Holy shit. I brought warm and cold clothes, and I had to stay in my cold clothes, the, the hoodie and long sleeve the whole time. I was not expecting that, but the action was hot and heavy, though, inside the MGM Grand. Pretty good show. Unfortunately, you guys didn't get to see the Mike Brown-Diego Nunez prelim fight. That was pretty good. Mike Brown is a guy that I'm a fan of and lost by decision, unfortunately. <laughs> Someone in the chat room said it's cold in the desert. Well, I know that. <laughs> I just didn't expect it to be uh, cold during the day. I know it gets cold at night in the desert. But anyway, back to 125. First fight that, that you guys saw was the lightweight bout between Clay Guida and Takanori Gomi. Guida got a second round submission on the Fireball Kid, and uh, I was pretty disappointed. I think I'm the only person on the planet who doesn't like Clay Guida. He's just like a riddling hyper caveman to me and I just think his style is just a little too reckless. Yeah, we always get action and you always get constant movement and I guess it worked in this case, but I was still disappointed. I was tell you being that it was the first fight of the main card in the first round, seeing the way Clay Guida moved, being that it was New Year's Day, pretty much national hangover day, I almost went to the bathroom and puked watching Clay Guida uh move around so much. He was making my head spin and I thought it was going on way too long. It was kind of ridiculous. But I knew that he had a method to his madness. You mentioned after the fact that he wanted to stay out of Gomi's striking zone, which is understandable. But in my opinion, Eric, there are different ways to do that. The submission really was something that caught me by surprise. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, that's the second submission victory for him in a row. So that's good looks to Rita. Gomi, he's a great fighter. I don't see him getting cut anytime soon. Maybe if he... Uh, gets knocked out maybe his next two fights. I, that's the only reason I could see him getting cut. It, it's a good win for Guida. Definitely one of his biggest wins. Is mm -hmm. he in title contention? No. Is he in top five of the lightweight? I think he's just outside. I think the mm -hmm. win definitely puts him up there as a serious contender, but uh, I, he really has to beat the, the top three, four guys first. Like, if he say he fought Jim Miller, he's you know, if you beat Jim Miller in the same fashion, then we could talk title for Clay Guida. But right now, 2011, I don't see any gold around Clay Guida's waist. Well, that guillotine certainly worked in this case. Moving on to the next bout in the welterweight division, Dong Young Kim defeated Nate Diaz but via unanimous decision. And after this, he was saying, he being Kim, that he could beat GSP. <laughs> what do you think about that sort of boasting, Rod? He's undefeated, but he's never beaten uh, a GSP. He wouldn't last two minutes with GSP. His wrestling is not on the same level. His striking is on the same level. He's a great fighter, don't get me wrong, but to call it GSP is pretty much going into a lake and challenging a crocodile and expecting to win. It's not going to happen. Uh, the, the fight itself with Nick Diaz, I'm a big Nick Diaz fan. I know some people think he's controversial. I think... Nate is a great Diaz, fighter. Sir. Nick, yes, I said Nick. Nate. Oh, uh, Nate, so Nate, sorry, sorry. Uh, 
Nate's Which Diaz. Which lifting jack-off are we talking about, Nick or Nate? <laughs> <laughs> Nate's Diaz. That's uh, right. So he, he, he's been looking good at Welts weight, but, again, it's the same problem with him. He does not stop that t- takedown. That's why he lost against Joe Stevenson. That's why he lost against Clay Guida. He he can't, for some reason, just doesn't stop the takedowns. I know he likes to work off his back. He's very dangerous off his back. He was actually doing a lot of damage in the Donyan King fight, uh, you know, with the elbows and punches, and it looked like the bigger fighter throughout the whole fight. Uh, Donyan King pretty much sat in uh, half guard and got side control a few times, but didn't really do anything effective. Um, and I could see how the judges scored the fight, but I... Um, you wouldn't be surprised if Nate Diaz, if they rematched him, would beat him a second time. Moving on into the light heavyweight division, Tiago Silva spanking Brandon Vera and winning by unanimous decision. Also breaking his nose in the process, we might add. Vera was cut after this fight along with lots of other guys. UFC seems to be like in cutting mode lately after some of these pay-per-views, including Phil Baroni. What would you think of Tiago Silva? Did he look dominant in the smashing of Brandon Vera's nose and the spanking? <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm a Tiago fan. I'm also a, a Vera fan as well. But since Vera dropped to let heavyweight, he really hasn't uh, looked that good. He lost to Keith Jardim. Uh, the loss to Randy Couture, I guess, was controversial, but he he wasn't the promising star that he once was when he was at welterweight. And ever since that Tim Sylvia loss, um, it's really been downhill for Vera. I know I, I question his motivation. Uh, he really didn't look like he was hungry. He didn't look like he was fighting for a career. UFC cut him, and I thought that was great news. If I was Dana White, I, I would have cut him as soon as the third round was over. I think they had it in their mind. He, he didn't look urgent. And it's not about winning or losing in the UFC. I mean, Dana White really explains it how. That the yeah, he's really been on the you have to show effort trip lately. Exactly. And being in the big game, you do have to show effort. It's the same thing in any sport. If you don't show effort, sooner or later, the time's going to come where you're going to have to find uh, another line of work. But Vera, uh, I don't think he's going to have any trouble. I'm sure he has really. A lot of offers fighting on small shows. But, um, I mean, I liked how uh, Tiago Silva was kind of egging him on a little bit, you know, trying to get the fire under his ass, uh, mm-hmm. getting some good striking action in the beginning of the second and third round. But for Vera, who's a, not only an accomplished wrestler, but an accomplished jiu-jitsu artist, and to not be busy on the ground was really what surprised me, Eric, because you don't think of Tiago Silva as um, a superior grappler. But he was able to really control Vera throughout the whole fight and didn't lose, not even a few seconds of the fight, and controlled him in the clinch, and Vera uh, pretty much just stood there. I don't know if he was overpowered or just confused or what, but he showed no sign of the truth, I should say. (laughs) Middleweight, Brian Stan, defeating Chris Lieben with a first-round TKO. Lieben having an impressive 2010 fighting and winning within two weeks of each other or so around the summer. And unfortunately, going into this fight, so he says afterwards and his trainers, that he came down with the flu or something and was just not in really good shape and ended up getting a TKO loss in the first round. And it seemed to knock him down a peg in the middleweight division that he seemed to be climbing back up into. And now we know that Brian Stan, out of all the people who have requested to face the axe murderer once he comes back from three broken ribs and knee surgery, is going to be the next one to face Wanderlei Silva in Silva's comeback fight sometime in the spring. So what do you think about this uh, knock or TKO, Rodney? Was it uh, a little questionable given his physical condition, that being Lieben, or did Brian Stan just shoot right past him and climbing up the middleweight ladder. I think Brian Stan showed that he was a hungry fighter. Uh, he, he called out Lieben and called him out for a reason because he knew a win over a name like Lieben, especially with the year that he had, uh, would, would really get him to the next step and make him not only more marketable, not only more people would be more aware of him, 
would really move him up the ladder and hopefully get him a title shot. You know, this guy's a former WC light heavyweight champion, and I feel like now uh, dropping down in the middle weight, he looks a lot leaner. Yeah, his striking has looked a lot better since uh, his WC days. Uh, against Vandalay Silva, it, it should be interesting. I, I don't see him winning. He beats Vandalay. That's a huge, huge step in the right direction for Brian Stan. He has potential to be a star. Especially with his military play. background. Exactly. If he made event to the fights for the troops, I think that would be very huge. Yeah. And, uh, they have been yeah. talking about doing a show over in Afghanistan, so that would be perfect for it, you would that, think. That would be perfect. And as far as Levin goes, I don't think anything really is going to happen to him. He's always going to be a name. People are always going to want to see him fight. And as far as him making any sort of title run, I didn't see it. Uh, you saw what happened the first time he faced Anderson Silva. What makes anybody think that that wouldn't happen again? Probably if not quicker. Really? You don't think even be- after all these years and all the fights he's had lately that he wouldn't last a little longer? Uh, no, I don't think so, because Levin moves forward, and that's exactly what Anderson Silva wants. Anderson Silva is a counterpuncher, is a counterstriker, and it would be a repeat. Levin just wants to go inside. The way Levin wins is that he suckers guys into a stand-up knockout brawl. But with uh, Anderson Silva, that's exactly the fight that you don't want. Hmm. The fight that we do want is the rematch now between Frankie Edgar and Gray Maynard. We'll get to the details in a second, but it looks like that that rematch is going to be happening later this year at 1.30, May 28th, same building that the original took place in at the MGM Grand. Now, the reason there's a rematch is because of the decision, which was the rare case of it being a draw. Now, I know you hate draws, Rodney, and everybody else does too, but... uh. Some people are of the mindset that they could understand this being ruled a draw. I don't know if I'd fall into that category because, all right, here's the the scoring. It was 46-48 Maynard, 48-46 Edgar, and then the third judge, 47-47. The way that works out is most of the judges, I didn't have their exact round-per-round scoring in front of me, but I believe they all scored it except for maybe that one 10-8, or 8-10 rather, in the first round for Maynard, because he was just so dominant. Now, am I very far off and wrong by saying that even if that score is warranted, and it probably is considering how utterly dominated and close to loss Edgar was, don't you think that he came back just as bad on Maynard in the second round? I would say just as bad, but it was a decisive ten nine round. All right, well he didn't, you... didn't dominate to the point where it was close to stoppage. Okay, like, so fair that, enough. So the, the, that first round was, reminded me of Matt Sarah and GSK pretty much. Okay. Well, that being said, I still felt by the end of the fight that Edgar had won it. I thought he won the second, fourth, and fifth rounds. Again, I don't have the exact scoring in front of me, but I think he came back enough to warrant a victory here. And I don't know. At first, Dana White was saying that they're going to go ahead with the unification fight with Pettis, and Maynard went and was all upset about it. Even though he didn't get the job done and didn't beat the champ, it ended in a draw. He had a change of heart, and they went with rematch instead. Pettis will be fighting Clay Guida. A lot of controversy about this fight, and uh, it's really all about the scoring and the decision. And what do you think, Rod? As you can imagine, I was pretty furious after a a great battle with these two young guys who basically started out as wrestlers displaying great discipline in mixed martial arts. When people talk about great MMA fights, they talk about Lennon Garcia and a Korean Zombie and Stephen Bonner and Forrest Griffin, which really are a great fights, but there's They're not a lot fest. of mentality. They're non-stop yeah. slugfests. But this displayed great wrestling takedowns, great uh, takedowns, great uh, stand-ups, you know, great counters, great combinations, it's just all-around great mixed martial arts. And this, mm-hmm. is a, this is a great way to start off the year. 
especially these two guys who were basically wrestlers, and they could show how much they evolved starting out with their hands. In the end, it was the right decision because hearing different Wait, wait, wait. Ask- you at first said that Edgar, you thought, had won, so you changed your oh, mind I, now? I, I mean, no, I still think Edgar won. I oh, okay. Won. Whichever guy won, it would have been controversial. No, it, There would have been no real winner. I right. think regardless of whoever's hand got raised, there would have been a rematch. Just hearing how many people thought Gray won, how many people thought Edgar won, it, it, it was a really close fight to me. Second round was Delphi Frankie. Fourth round was Delphi Frankie. I mean, to me, I had it almost every round Frankie. I, I didn't see Gray really do a lot to um to win each round. The third round was close. The fifth round was close. And I watched this fight three times before Monday morning came because mm-hmm. it was just that great, that close, and I really wanted to see what the judges saw, what the audience saw, and if maybe there's something I missed. Still inconclusive, uh, huh? No, three times watching it over, I still think Frank Yeager won. I still think he got more combinations. It was close, but I think Frankie edged him out, and that's my opinion, and I'm sticking to it. When they go for a third time, uh, I believe that Frankie is really going to learn a lot from this fight. This is the only guy that gave him his only MMA defeat, and I think right now this gives him just more fire to go out and defend his belt and prove that he's uh, you know, up there with the past pound best. Well, they've already proven themselves. Some of the up-and-coming fighters looking to make their name were on the Strikeforce Challengers 13 event uh, at the beginning of the month. Jim Ross, who happens to be a big MMA fan and blogs about it all the time, blag. He wrote a criticism about this event in that he feels that not just the production in general, but the announcers, I guess in specifics, don't give us an idea who these names are. I mean, if if the people who voted on our polls didn't even vote for Kazushi Sakuraba, a fucking MMA legend in Japan, probably don't even know who he is. I, I seriously doubt they're going to know the Strike Force Challengers headliners. But uh, his criticism was that they don't give us an idea of who these people are, the personalities, and why we should care. They seem to just be going along as if everyone's just in on it, that they expect everyone to be these diehard MMA fans. And uh, what do you think about Jim Ross's criticism and of the event itself, Rodney? I agree. It comes off as a local show. It seems like a local show. 3-0, 2-0 records. Uh, in some cases, the first um, professional fight. Some guys have a 10-2 record, like... Um, has Safferdine who fought Tyron Woodley in the main event. But it was a very quiet 10 and 2. It's almost like if, if you're watching wrestling in 1995, it's like watching at the stars. Mm-hmm. Um, you'll maybe get like one or two names, but most of them you, you'll never hear about these guys. And a lot of these guys don't even make it to the local shows. So I, I think there really needs to be consistency and a sense of, I guess, stardom in these, in these guys. I think Tyron Woodley is the only one who uh, they're really pushing for, and maybe even Daniel Cormier. But other than that, I, I agree with Jamal's. Well, it's funny you mentioned these local shows, because the way I like to compare it is about 13 years ago, when wrestling was really big, you saw a lot of indies crop up, because not only were WWF oh, and WCW... Oh, Jesus. Yeah, I know. Uh, <laughs> not only were WWF and WCW doing super great. They were bringing everyone along with them. The rising ocean brings up all the boats with it. And not only was ECW hot because wrestling was hot too, uh, you had indies cropping up all over the place. A lot of these current wrestlers like CM Punk and his contemporaries started wrestling back then. They trained back then. Guys probably weren't like NWO shirts during the week and going to, to train and starting their careers then. Well, it's kind of like that with MMA now. I notice a whole lot of, let's call them indie wrestling shows, cropping up, in, at least in our area. I don't know how it is outside the tri-state area, but in uh, Pennsylvania and New Jersey and in that sort of area, you see a lot of stuff, the Asylum Fight Leagues, the Ring of Combats, Matrix Fights, uh, Blackman MMA, Steve Blackman is a trainer and promoter of MMA now. Dan Severn is still promoting MMA shows. 
out in Michigan, I believe. So you can see a lot of these sort of things, and I've gone to a lot of them. First of all, the the, the GA prices, these tickets are astronomically ridiculous. When these fucking, let's call them indie MMA companies, are asking, like, at least, like, $30 for GA, are you fucking kidding me? You get in there, and you see essentially tomato cans for a good portion of the car. And that's not all of them. I've been to lots of good MMA cards, but they're still too fucking expensive. I swear to God, there was one place or two that were charging between like 40 and $50 for GA. Get the fuck out of here. You can stay home and pay less for a UFC pay-per-view and see like the best in the world practically fight on TV where you can actually see it. So what I'm getting at is what you were saying about letting us get to know some of these fighters, you get a program. Because let's face it, most of these guys are local guys from the local school, the local jiu-jitsu school, the local MMA school, and most a lot of them are teammates. I, I have seen some of the Matrix fights that Sam Kaplan was the matchmaker for, and he put together great cards because they, they brought in fighters from all over, Minnesota, Virginia, not just the local guys. But you get the program and you only see like a name and what corner they are, the red or blue corner. And you don't even know shit about them. I mean, it would just pay off a lot more if you put in just a little effort when you're putting stuff like that together to do a little research, let us know who these people are. But, uh, I guess as the sport grows, they're going to have some growing pains and learn as they go. But, Speaking of growing pains, uh, you're back in training, aren't you, Rodney? Yeah, I just started again last week. I'm hoping to do a tournament um, in Red Bank next Saturday. I'm still not sure about that because I still not feel that um, I'm really back in, you know, championship shape. But I'm going to try to uh, do what I can, see if I can get some more hours in this week and next week. And when the day comes closer, I'll decide. But, yeah, it feels good to be training again. December was a busiest month for work, so I really only went to training all the, uh, like, one time. But uh, it's, it's fun to be back. It's good to see the guys again. I've run in athletics, and uh, I'm excited to compete again. Unfortunately, the big tournaments such as Naga and Grappler's Quest aren't going to be around for a few months, but I'm going to start looking at small tournaments to uh, keep myself active. What's this one in Red Bank? It's called the Grappler's Challenge. All right, cool. Well, we'll give you an update on that on WrestlingRoundTable.com. Are you going to... Saturday the 29th. Okay, Saturday the 29th. Now, staying in the mixed martial arts realm for a little bit longer, we want to talk about the heavyweights of the sport because you and I, Rodney, and everyone else generally who's been talking about strike force specifically in their heavyweight division, has just been riding them for all the mistakes they've made. Well... We've seen in the past few years, it's relatively recent, I would say, the UFC heavyweight division just exploded. It's just been awesome as far as that roster goes. Up until really this past year or so, I mean, just taking a quick glance over it, Czech Congo was coming up, and people were looking at him as uh, maybe the next breakout guy down the line, but he can't stop pulling shorts. Mirko Krokop is just hit or miss, really, and being on the latter end of his career, that fucking horrible, horrible fight with Frank Mir was just the complete opposite of that fight he had with Pat Barry. Pat Barry seems to have also dropped off the radar recently, but uh, we had contract dispute with Roy Nelson between him and Roy Jones Jr. Promotions or something. That's been holding him up for a while. Shane Carwin looked great up until the, the loss to Lesnar and seemed to have really gassed himself out in that first round and somewhat exposed himself, and then he had surgery. And it always seems like he's on the outs with UFC management anyway. Stefan Struve looked impressive in his last fight, but uh, he seems to be the only one because... Uh, well, of course, we got Velasquez, the champion, undefeated, looking great in his fight, but he had the surgery on a partially torn, well, I guess 90% isn't partially, that's mostly, a uh, torn rotator cuff, and he's going to be out until about the spring or so. so. Then you got Big Nog, Minotaro Noguera, and he's been out as well. 
And then we get to Brock Lesnar and Junior Dos Santos. Of course, Junior Dos Santos looking great in his last several fights, but the big news with Brock Lesnar lately is that all this WrestleMania talk has been springing up again as if it had a fucking chance. Dana White squashed that just as we knew he would, but from all reports, it seems like Lesnar has not been training and uh, not really been talking to UFC management up until, I guess, recently because he's going to be uh, one of the two coaches on the next season for the Ultimate Fighter. Him and Junior Dos Santos are going to be coaching welterweights to culminate in the Ultimate Finale later in the year. They will have a fight to determine who faces Velasquez. Junior Dos Santos originally had the shot in the bag, uh, but now they're throwing this in there. And I can't say I'm real happy about it. Before I get back to you, Rodney, I want to see what you guys think about at least the heavyweight division as far as UFC goes. We'll get to strike force in a little bit. But, uh, Will Valfides, your thoughts on the state of the heavyweight division in UFC and specifically the Lesnar situation with the Ultimate Fighter? I started getting into UFC right around when Lesnar started in May. And, and you know, I got really into it. You I know, think and you and a ton of wrestling fans can say the same yeah. thing. I admit it. I started watching them way before that still, but I wasn't like a diehard, like, I'll go to watch every pay-per-view, basically. Right. Uh, Lesnar goes where the money goes. That's just the bottom line, folks. You know, the guy's already made a ton of money. It's good that he's getting himself back on TV because, you know, he's going to have, like, a permanent role on TV. He might spike some ratings. I mean, definitely he's going to get some ratings for that show. Well, if you Kimbo know, Slice can spike the ratings for Ultimate Fighter, I think Lesnar can do the same in route to promoting his book that comes out in April. Yeah, the whole WrestleMania thing is, uh, I, I don't see that ever. Yeah. I think putting Brock Lesnar on the alternate fighter really is, like, the best way of going about how, like, how everybody's injured right now. No one, it's, it seems like they lost a couple guys in the heavyweight division. Putting him on network TV, on in front of everybody, on every TV every week is the best way of going about because he's still technically the biggest name they have in the division. And he's people, he's a guy that people want to see. So putting him on network TV once a week is a good idea. He, well, no, he, he is the pay-per-view him. king. I mean, Pacquiao and Mayweather do million buys for the one or two times they fight a year, but Lesnar pretty much draws a million every time he fights. And th- barring the sickness he had, I think he's just been the pound-for-pound pound pay-per-view king the past few years. He's been helping – I mean, not solely – because Rashad Evans and Quentin Jackson did a huge draw, too. But Lesnar's their fucking star. He's always there, right up in GSP, not too far behind, I would think. I just want him to do this until he, until he um, does WrestleMania with against Undertaker. But until then, you know, that's what he did. Well, Rodney, I wasn't a fan of this whole announcement, really. I do, in a way, find it odd that the two heavyweights, Dos Santos and Lesnar, are coaching welterweights because what are they going to teach them to lay on their opponent using their weight? I don't know, but that that may not be the, the an excuse not to do it. But don't you think Lesnar should be on this show learning shit instead of teaching based on his past performance against Velasquez? First to talk about the initial announcement, I mean, I was site number one that it watched all wrestling rumors. Right. Number two, I was excited to see, you know to see him, to see him on the show because Brock Lesnar is a draw. People want to know what is this crazy guy doing? What is this freak athlete saying? What is this former professional wrestler going to say next? What is the biggest star? What is this crazy hunting guy going to say? <laughs> so I, I think people are really going to get into the show because the uh, the intrigue that just the name and uh, the brand of Brock Lesnar. But as far as him being a coach, uh, yeah, 5-2 and two record, that's where I was a little hesitant. I, I really wasn't fond of the idea. I was like, this guy, uh, the whole intrigue of watching his next fights is to see how, what has he improved on. Uh, I mean, obviously striking is something he really needs to improve on. But at the same time, given the people he, he's beat, in the short amount of time, and also being a NCAA tra- uh, heavyweight champion, I think that does give him the you know credibility to train these guys. I'm sure he's going to bring a great team. He's going to really mold these guys into real athletes, and I think that's something that you're going to see on the show. Um, and it's really going to also help the Junior DeSantis brand. 
Uh, I think Brock, Brock knows his role. He knows why he's being asked to. Um, well, The Rock you know, told him so. Yeah, Brock, Brock, Brock knows his role. Brock knows, you know, that he's the heel. He, he's the, the main rating star right now. Because as good as Junior DeSantis says, no one's going to turn in to see him, especially with uh, the language barrier. But, you know, who knows what Brock is going to do during taping? Who knows he's going to really try to provoke a junior and, you know, try to, you know, get people behind Junior. So when the fight comes, it's really a mega fight. And for Junior, you really have to be happy with this opportunity because, yeah, it would be great going against Cain Velasquez, but now you get an opportunity to fight deep paper if you can, and that is really going to put a lot of dollars in your pocket. And you saw his weakness, and his weakness plays into your strength, and you have a very good chance of winning that fight and getting the championship match anyway. Well, Talking about the hype and the star power, don't you think that if they had gone with, let's say, Frank Mir instead, that it'd be an even better as far oh, as a whole, yeah, a whole season of trash talking between these guys building been, up to a rubber been, match? It would have been off. It would have been the highest rated Ultimate Fighter ever, and. Nothing, but nothing could break it. Unless you had Pacquiao Mayweather on there, nothing would break it. <laughs> well, don't you think that <laughs> it's a better fight as far as Lesnar's win column goes to fight Mir again instead of Dos Santos? Uh, yeah, I, I don't feel. All right, the, the Velasquez fight, I, I had. I was pretty optimistic, but this, no way. I, I really, I'm a black guy, but I really don't see him getting his hand raised. And if he does his kid's hand raised. That would be his biggest win in my eyes. His biggest win, and that really, you know, cement the fact that this guy has really evolved and takes the sport seriously. But if the way Junior trains, the team he has, his wrestling defense, his great jiu-jitsu, he works with the Garrett brothers, he's from that elite group of Brazil guys. I don't see him losing. I'm sorry. We also didn't see... Fedor losing, and he did, and that brings us to the Strike Force heavyweight division, something we've been criticizing them for all year. It seems like they might have come up with a solution. Uh, that would be the Strike Force World Grand Prix heavyweight tournament that starts off in New Jersey that we're going to in a few weeks, actually, and it's going to be all year. Now, the heavyweight champion, Alistair Overeem, will be in the tournament. His belt will not be on the line in these fights. They will be three rounds, each of five minutes until the finals, which will be five five-minute rounds. And then, should Alistair not win, the winner gets a title shot. Now, we just talked about Velasquez, and some people were saying that with beating Lesnar, that he's the top heavyweight in the world, 9-0, to undefeated, first round destroying people. However... Could an argument not be made for Alistair Overeem, Strikeforce heavyweight champion, within the same month, not only winning the K1 World Grand Prix in very quick, very dominating fashion, also winning the newly created Dream Interim uh, heavyweight championship, although it's, it's weird that they didn't have a heavyweight champion in the first place, but it's interim, but... I guess Dream is just the uh, strike force of Japan in that sense. At any rate, it was a last-minute thrown-together fight with Todd Duffy, but he defeated him re really quickly, too. He's the first MMA fighter to win K1, and he's got three belts simultaneously. Incredible striker. Don't you think an argument could be made for Alistair Overeem being the top heavyweight in the world, Rod? In MMA, no. Uh, there's, there's still a lot of big names that he has to beat. Uh, I think he's up there. I really, really made Brett Rogers look like uh, like like a kid who didn't belong in the cage, mm -hmm. um, I was, and I was really surprised by that. But like in the past uh, few years, he has really evolved and has established himself as a top guy. But this will prove to see how well he faces against like top, you know top tier guys of the heavyweight division in MMA. Uh, I mean, it was impressive knocking out Todd Duffy in that short amount of time, and that was, you know, supposedly UFC's, like, next big hit. Right. And, um, yeah, and Mike Russo put a call to it, and, you know, Overeem just kicked that idea to the curb. All right, well, 
that being said, this is going to be Fedor's comeback fight. Of course, the man who beat him, Fabricio Verdum, is also participating in this tournament. But uh, this fight is going to be against the giant head of Antonio Bigfoot Silva. Whew. That's a big challenge. Uh, how do you think Fedor is going to fare against Bigfoot? It's going to be a lot harder for him than people think. Uh, yeah. Bigfoot is a good striker, and he's uh, pretty good on the ground. But, uh, it, again, it's Fedor Milenko, and it's it's a great first challenge, a great bounce-back fight after losing against uh, Fabricio Verdum. But, again, uh, with this whole strike force thing, I'm just really confused by it because... Well, Eric, what is the point of having this tournament? If because they had nothing. The the <laughs> they didn't have they anything had... going on before that. But now, now they just signed Barnett. You know that they get Favor back on track. You know they get the Doom back on track. And people was wondering. I mean, we were wondering if Fedor was going to fight in strike for any time soon. I yeah. mean, they, they, it, there's always these announcements that get people excited and strike forces. Throw something else at you that gets you disappointed. You know what? I, I, I'm going to throw this out there just for the fuck of it, because I think this tournament's made their heavyweight division that was a mess at least somewhat interesting. I think they should have put Herschel Walker, Batista, and Lashley in it just for the fuck of it. How about that? I think you, I think you would have seen three deaths in one tournament. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I How about just a big oh. gauntlet fight against Alistair Overeem? Did you know they were oh. actually trying to set up Herschel Walker against Don Fry or Mark Coleman? What the fuck are they thinking? Oh, man, again, Herschel Walker would, would be lost. Yeah, he trains with great fighters, but he, two veterans like that, no, they're not going to lose to uh, Herschel Walker. Not, it wouldn't even be a fight. Wouldn't even be a fight. Where the hell is Tank Abbott when you need him? But anyway, exactly. anyway uh, let's wrap up with your thoughts on uh, the heavyweight tournament in general you were about to say before I had to cut you off from my goofy jokes. <laughs> well, the way they have the bracket set up, on one side they have the corner finals, uh, Fedor Silva and Aubrey and Verdum. On the other side, it's Olofsky, it's uh, Cartanos, it's Barnett and Rogers. Now, if you were strike force, first of all, I don't know if I'd have Fedor and Aubrey go face-to-face, because if they're going to fight each other, they might as well fight each other for the belt, not in the tournament. So that right there, I think, is mistake number one. And number two, I know they really want to set up Fado and Verdum. I mean, Fado and Overeem want to have them the other side of the bracket so there's a good chance they could face each other in the finals. Now, you know, only one of them could go to the finals, and that's really going to, um, I guess, kill the momentum of finding out the real number one fighter. In the final in the final fight, it's it's a great idea, but I, I still it could use a lot of tweaks. I feel like every day Strike Force is making it goofier and goofier, but in the end, people are still going to watch and people are still going to talk about it. Are you going to stick around for our talk a little later on of the new generation, Rodney? Because last time we were going to follow up on some of the best and worst debuts, returns, and makeovers. You said you would stick around, and you didn't. And I was all set to talk about Ric Flair's debut in, in WWF in 91 and how much it sucked. And you were like, oh, oh I'm going to disagree with you there. And you were nowhere to be found. Oh, man, I'm sorry. I didn't um, – I think maybe it was all the TNA talk that uh, I couldn't listen <laughs> to. Well, there's going to be more of that. Oh, man. I will, I will be going this time, Eric. All right. Cause I, uh, I, wish I, I wish I could stick around, but um, – I oh, I was so planning on talking about Jeff Jarrett too. Oh man, now you now you twist my arm. <laughs> <laughs> That's double J, double M A, Rodney. <laughs> when the time comes, you will hear my thoughts on the great one, the great the great MMA fighter Jeff Jarrett. <laughs> That's right. Well, thank you, Rodney. We're going to move on to pro wrestling in a few minutes, but first. We also have polls going on, and I want to read some of the results of some of our latest polls. I think they're particularly interesting. It's kind of outdated now, but we had a poll on will The Miz hold the WWE Championship until WrestleMania? 5% of you said yes, and he'll keep it afterwards, too. (laughs) 6% said no, he'll lose it this month, which was in December. Wrong. 19% said yes, he will hold it until WrestleMania. He'll lose it then. And most of you had a tie. 35% split between no, he will hold it until 
the Rumble. And some of you thought, no, he'll lose it in February at the Elimination Chamber, I suppose. Well, we're on our way to that, so we'll see how that holds up. But we also had what was the best show in December. I mixed in mixed martial arts and pro wrestling, as everyone loves. Just to piss you off. 6% of the vote went to Strike Force Henderson versus Babalu 2, which was my vote because it was all finishes and all awesome. 11% went to TNA Final Resolution. 13% voted for UFC 124, GSP, Koscheck. We had a tie for second place, 17% between WEC and WWE. 17% went to TLC 2010 and... Another 17% went to the last WEC, WEC show ever, WEC 53. However, the overwhelming majority voted for Ring of Honor's Final Battle 2010 I pay per view, streamed on our partners over at Go Fight Live. Really good show, and seems like Ring of Honor has been nothing but hits on I pay per view lately. And we have a poll right now on WrestlingRoundTable.com. Who do you want to see come back at WrestleMania the most? Go ahead and vote over there at WrestlingRoundTable.com. And now we move on to pro wrestling. And for that, we have Corey from Chicago on the line. Hello, Corey. Hello, Eric. I actually survived the TNA Genesis pay-per-view. <laughs> we'll be talking about that in just a few moments, Corey. But I want to bring on a couple other calls now that we have you. Zach from Arkansas. Hello. Hey, how you guys doing? Doing all right, Zach. What do you have in mind? I was just letting you know that I was actually uh, um, at the Raw taping uh, for uh, last night and uh, uh, wanted to let you guys know that uh, apparently um, on the very last uh, segment of the show, with, uh, I'm not even quite sure who he is, who came in the the new Nexus member. Right. I believe you are referring to Mason Ryan, the Florida championship wrestling heavyweight champion, or as everyone called him for a few seconds, Batista. Exactly. Yeah. That's what I was, that's what I was, yeah, that's what I was saying. Uh, Cause uh, we had about, uh, you know, 15, uh, you know, probably 10 and under uh, kids that were around yelling out Batista. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but yeah, I'll, I'll let you guys talk for a little bit, and uh, if you want, you can always get back at me, okay? Well, you know what? We're going to talk about that Raw a little later on. Uh, our buddy Abe in Augusta, Georgia. Hello. Hello, Eric. By the way, I did check out some of those old shows on iTunes for the Wrestling Roundtable. Mm-hmm. And? Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> I'll be listening. You bring back and we talk about the new generation. And by the way... I sit. I sat through some of this. I couldn't watch the rest after the Motor City Machine Guns and um and Beer Money. Why is that? Okay, you know the X Division, the tag match really good, but by the end, I don't know why. I just can't. I just don't like the rest of it. Hey, by the way, if you own some pay per view, you basically see the rest of the Impact about the rest of the next couple of weeks. Let's bring on one more. Amato in San Antonio, Texas. Hello, Amato. Hey guys. You did mention San Antonio, and I did want to um, bring on the fact that uh, I did see what y'all wrote on the round table, table, and I'm pretty sure everybody saw that WWE is putting Shawn Michaels in the Hall of Fame. He's the the big draw this year and the big name. Yeah. Uh, just one year after he, you know, got uh, retired. Mm -hmm. And um, one thing I was reading is this bashing that um, Shane Helms is doing all over Twitter about Shawn and. I was just mm -hmm. wondering if, if y'all were going to, you know, try to touch up on, I mean, what's this, what's this fucking deal? Well, we could talk about it now. First of all, Shawn Michaels in the Hall of Fame, uh, when he, and he being Shane Helms, was ripping on that, all right, I have given Shawn Michaels more shit than anybody during the course of this show, and I still feel rightfully so. That being said, as a performer, he could have been in the Hall of Fame years ago, and no one could have disputed that. So uh, there's absolutely no way that you could say he shouldn't go in, which I think he was saying on his fucking stupid Twitter. But that being said, I've never – well, I, I can't say never. I haven't been a fan of, let's say, the Carolina trampoline backyard crew in like 10 years, <laughs> maybe nine years or so. I used to be a fan of Sugar Shane Helms and WCW, not really since – Used to like the Hardy Boys back in 99, not since, really. 
So I'm not a fan of theirs per se. However, I love vitriol and I love when the bullshit stops because you see so many times in pro wrestling, and I'm speaking from experience here, that you see people say one thing publicly, whether it's in interviews or on camera or whatever, but they say the complete fucking opposite as soon as the light goes off or they're talking off the record. So there's a big level of phoniness going on, and I love when that drops and the bitterness just comes out. I just love it when people just stop giving a shit and just start ripping. Kevin Nash is the master, and I love him for it. So when guys like that start talking about specific incidents, like, man, it was so fucked up when Shawn Michaels said this to catering to Jericho. Oh, I love it when this comes out. So uh, I, I think it goes to a degree. I think there's no way he could say that Shawn Michaels doesn't deserve to be in the Hall of Fame no matter what. But let's see what you guys think. Will Brooks? I think Shawn Michaels is supposed to be in, but I thought this was supposed to be like a WCW-themed you know, Hall mm-hmm. of Fame. It's kind of put some mention in that. So. Not necessarily. Everyone's expecting Arn Anderson to come out any minute. Danny Hodge, I, I wouldn't... Be the one. Well, I thought it was going to be a name that night, actually. But then they kept saying okay, greatest well, of all time. It had, to be, it had to be Shawn Michaels at that point. Well, clearly Shawn Michaels is going to be the main event slot of this uh, Hall of Fame since it's the Hall of Fame is booked like a wrestling card anyway. Uh, but that being said, I don't think the WCW theme is dead on the water just yet. Nash is an under contract, and the whole clique will be there. So it'd be cool to have the two dudes with attitudes going at the same time. That it'll happen, but it's a possibility. Sting is still not under contract at TNA. Goldberg is a name that they were still thinking about. Arn Anderson is pretty much a lock. They've been talking about Dean Malenko. That's cool. And, of course, Jim Ross has been pushing for Danny Hodge, who's not exactly a WCW guy. That's earlier NWA sort of time, but close enough, I suppose. So I don't think it's dead on the water just yet. But that being said, it is funny that all this talk about a WCW theme and yet WWF has to trump all of it because, you know, Michaels has skyrocketed past those guys. I still think that Ron Simmons should be in there. But uh, let's get back to the hurricane tweeting thing. So, Will Vafides, what are your thoughts on everything Shawn Michaels? Uh, I, I'm also with you, Eric. I didn't like the guy. You know, I was a Bret Hart mark. I never liked the guy, but when he came back, when he found God, he definitely wasn't the same Shawn Michaels anymore. So, you know... <laughs> Not he, according he, to Hurricane, if you're a caterer. Well, 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 first off, he gets a forum to speak their mind on the internet. You know, that's what we all get to do. And this is how you generate some heat or at least some buzz when someone says something like that comment. Now, he has his own opinion, and you get to voice that on the Internet. Now, he may be wrong in doing it, but he gets to do it. Just like if Shawn Michaels wanted to respond, he could respond saying something back. Well, he does respond tweeting like a fucking 14-year-old girl without saying anything. (laughs) LOL. yeah, but there's the point, you know. But you think Shawn Michaels cares what Sugar St. Helms really honestly thinks about him? I mean, honestly. Or, or even the Hardys or anybody. You know, first off, he's been in this business a lot longer than all those guys. Those guys got to do things a little bit not as the same as as he had to go through. He had to go through hell, you know, basically to get where he got. You know, he deserves to be in the Hall of Fame 100%. You know, as far as Helms goes... You know, he's not, he doesn't have a job right now. So, honestly, I don't know why yes, he, he should be. he does with Lucha Libre USA. Okay, so he has a job that did not pay like WWE does. Okay. Right. So, you know, good for him that he has that, but he doesn't have, you know, what Shawn Michaels got. He never got to where Shawn Michaels got, you know. But, the you know, so he can be pissed off all he wants that he doesn't like Shawn. That's fine. I'm sure other wrestlers feel the same way about him. But, you, you know, you attack the guy, you can do that all you want, but the point is he's in the Hall of Fame, you're not, and you probably ever, no, won't ever be. And, you know, as far as the Hardys go, you know, they could trash, you know, anybody they want to. That's that's their whole thing. That's their whole show is about. Hmm. They call everything out. You know, so. That would be the CM Punk. You could do yeah, yeah. Punk. That's the video I'm talking about. That was just ridiculous. I, I was like, you know, who cares? I, I don't personally care. You know, he's got the whole Tyler Rex thing going with his hair, but Shawn Michaels in the Hall of Fame, and, you know, Helms or anybody else can tweet about it, say how much they hate him, and then we'll talk about this in two weeks. Well, I'm to summarize, they're all fags. Anyway, <laughs> let's move on to TNA Genesis. First pay-per-view of the year for pro wrestling, and the storyline seems to be their version of 
I don't want to say NWO, but that sort of factional thing. Immortal, getting all the belts. Horseman style, fortune style, whatever. All these fucking names. Either way, uh, that that was the theme of the night and started off with Kazarian defeating Jay Lethal for the X Division title. What do you think about that opener, Will Vafidez? I thought it was a very good match, actually. Um, you know, again, Kazarian, he's got it, man. He, you know, talk about a guy who left a while ago and then he came back. You know, I really didn't think they were going to do anything with him. But, boy, he's really turned up the heat on this. I mean, again, Jay Lethal, you know, had a great last year with Ric Flair. And mm-hmm. he lost all that. He lost all that. Now, that's not his fault either because that's all TNA's fault. You know, management just doesn't, you know, gave him something really good and killed him. And, you know, because Kaz deserves to hold the belt. That was, again, another great X Division match, as they can always do. Again, it's another opener, another X Division opener. Antonio Banderas' stunt double wins the belt for the fourth time. (laughs) Beer Money also won the tag belts for a fourth time, defeating the Motor City Machine Guns. What do you think about this, Corey? Did they cut off Motor City Machine Guns tag reign a little too soon, or was it fitting considering the history between these two teams? In one respect, I did want the Motor City Machine Guns to retain the belts a little longer, but that's really my only complaint. The rest of the match was pretty good. I didn't like the finish where Saban accidentally kicked Alex, and then, you know, he got rolled up. But outside of that, this was the best match on the whole card. This was absolutely the show stealer. Everything after that, oh, good Lord. Hmm. I like the ending, and the reason why I like the ending is because the machine guns only beat themselves. They didn't lose to a finisher. So it doesn't kill them either. So that's why I like that's why I like the finish because it still keeps them strong. It just it's like you make a mistake, and, and when you make a mistake, you lose the belt. Yeah, that, that's what happened. So that's why I like to finish for that because it didn't kill the machine gun. That's an interesting point. Moving on, the split up Team 3D 2011 version. Bully Ray defeated Brother Devon by disqualification. How do you think this version is going down, Will, compared to the juxtaposed heel face dynamic of last time with Reverend Devon and Deacon Batista, I might add? Do you realize that Abyss? Samoa Joe, the Pope, you know, were not going to be on this show, and they put this match on it. <laughs> We've seen this before. The only difference is that he's not in the priest outfit. I don't really care. I don't even know why they resigned with TNA. I don't understand it. If they're not going to be doing tag stuff, why are they in the TNA? I don't well, get because it. they have a school down there that they get what? students for. You know, I mean, honestly, how many tag teams can split up and have a great career besides that. You know, they're not known, Bully Ray's not going to be known for Bully Ray. You know, there's not, uh, there's only a, a little, a couple of guys that can get over, you know, without their tag partner. And these two guys are not it. They, they should be together, and they're not. And I don't get it. Well, I called Kazari and Antonio Banderas a stunt double. I think with all the ridiculous names like Sean Penn and Jim Carrey attached to that Three Stooges movie that hopefully never gets made, why the fuck isn't uh, Bubba Ray playing Curly? Nah. And, anyway, moving on, you said Abyss wasn't scheduled to be on the show, but he had to fill in for an injured AJ Styles, filling in for the TV title match against Douglas Williams, and Abyss won the belt. Slow. It was so slow. This should have been a good match. I like Doug Williams. I like Abyss. But for some reason, this was just outrageously slow. And then to make matters worse, we killed the entire match by having a crippled AJ hobble in at the last minute to help Abyss win. And it was so obvious the referee was staring at him as he did this. I'm surprised nobody caught this. It was just a ridiculous match. Oh, and actually, I thought Kazarian looked more like Scott Hall. I don't see that one. I see him jumping out of explosions with Selma Hayek. Matt Hardy made his TNA debut to pretty much no one's shock against Rob Van Dam with his foot on the ropes. Man, were they riding Matt Hardy on our message board. Someone said that he looked like Amazing Kong in Whiteface. What would you think of Matt Hardy's debut, Will? Unspectacular? 
Yeah, nothing that caught my eye. Especially when you see these two fight before, you know they could do better. It just didn't seem like they did like cared as much. Hardy doesn't look like he's working out. Uh, honestly, he has a little bit of a cut there that I, from the last time we saw him three months ago. So I don't know about that, but you know, it wasn't definitely memorable. It wasn't a good, you know, debut. He's too busy him. setting up his webcam. Yeah. He loves that webcam. He loves that Twitter, man. Twitter is Twitter and Matt Hardy is like marriage. That's the marriage of Matt Hardy. <laughs> well, MMA expert Jeff Jarrett continued this yeah. angle with <laughs> Kurt Angle <laughs> that I find hilarious, but it went this to is no the contest. Gimmick. This is the this is the best gimmick that he has ever had, and, and he's the only guy in the company that really gets real. Like people hate him. Like I love that gimmick. I don't care. Rodney may hate him. But he, this gimmick is actually one of the best gimmicks he's ever did. Well, I think that plays a lot into it. The 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 I I guess legit hate that people have for Jeff Jarrett, but the way he uses it for his character is just really awesome and unbelievable. And I love how yep. the guys he's beating, like Samoa Joe and Kurt Angle, have never done MMA. They're representing yep. MMA, but I mean, I get it, I get it, but it's just it's, it's just a joke. It's all you know, it's all a joke. You know, Jeff Jarrett really can't really beat these guys, but the whole right. point is that he's putting he's putting stipulations on everything to make him look good, which is really like the funniest part. And then he retires as a as a MMA fighter, which was like I tell you, this is like the funniest part of whole, of all TNA. I love this feud. Mm-hmm. It's just pretty. It's good. I mean, uh, but the one thing we, obviously we have to talk about is the Three second blade job that uh, I'm sure you know Corey saw. The camera zoomed in on Kurt Angle. He looks into the camera, pulls out a blade, and cuts himself in the head. And he dropped it too. And the camera caught the whole thing. Not once did this camera guy think, oh, maybe I should switch to another shot. Maybe I should put the camera on somebody who's not Kurt Angle. No, he zoomed in nice and close so the whole audience saw it. Got to the point where the crowd was chanting, you just bladed, clap, 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 clap. It was well, ridiculous. TNA is not known for its great direction. And it, no it, difference here. The production, yeah, Martin Scorsese does not book here. Well, the, the, it's really the production, though. Don't, you got to blame the, can, the, the, the technical director, the director. Well, that's the what I meant, the, the, their yeah. direction. The, That's the, the, horrible, but 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 this is exactly why TNA can't be, you know, competition or can't be anything for something like that. That you know, I don't remember even W ever doing that ever. Uh, you, you can know. find a couple times, but not okay. All. But do you, this, but this this like points out that you know it makes look, it makes Kurt Angle look really bad. You know, if I was Kurt Angle, I would go find the freaking technical director and be like, "What the fuck were you doing?" Why did you press the button? What? Why did you press the button right when I was blading? You can see it on the monitor what he's doing. It's like, okay. I mean, come on. It's like, Stop it. Stop it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. I feel bad for Kurt Angle because talk about a guy who works hard, you know, and gets that kind of shit, you know. I, that's, you know, it's fucked up. Now, it's just fucked up. Real- Realistically, what's worse for Kurt Angle, the fact that everybody under God saw him blade on the biggest screen possible, or the fact that Jeff Jarrett threatened to bring back Kankle Jarrett, uh, I'm sorry, Karen Angle, the following week? That's just bad. He's in a worse possible situation. Hey, Karen Angle's coming back on TV. There's nothing bad that can come out of that. No, for my penis. Absolutely not. Yeah, well, not. I'm not looking. I'm not talking about that. But I'm saying, for storyline wise, it's maybe gonna Kurt Angle will go off the deep end. But as long as I get to look hey, at a hot piece what, of former stripper ass. What other, what other realistic storyline does TNA have besides this one that, that you could really actually believe? I can't believe you just said that about her. Did you not hear the sound that came out of her face that she says is her voice? Oh, good yeah, lord! Yeah, sounds great. That following Thursday, she made this screechy sound. I don't think I can repeat it. <laughs> oh, don't start that. <laughs> well, let's move on to the main story of the night, which was the former Ken Kennedy, Mr. Anderson, winning his first world title. First, he gets past Matt Morgan. Then he defeats butterfly champion Jeff Hardy. <laughs> Now, this is a guy that WWE pegged years ago is going to be their next big star, going to be the champion. He's going to hold the money in the bank for like a year, and then he's going to win the belt or some shit. And, of course, that never really panned out. 
And uh, not his fault either. He comes back from the concussion that he suffered from Jeff Hardy, and of course, this is the culmination of all that. What do you think about Ken Anderson finally winning the belt, Corey? Well, I like that he won the belt, but I think his match where he won the belt could have been a little bit better because it seems like everybody and their grandmother just jumped in the ring at some point. I mean, Mick Foley was there, Eric Bischoff was there, and really this should have been a singles match with no interference. That's really Yeah, but were people thing. saying that, speaking of Foley, years ago when Foley won the belt on Raw exactly. for the tape you, January man. 4th show for 1999, Austin interfered, DX was there, the McMahons, blah, 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 but I don't think anybody mentions any of that shit compared to nope. the, just the fact that Foley won the belt. Just playing devil's advocate, Corey. Yeah, but outside of yeah. that, I'm li- I'm glad that Ken Anderson won, though. I was I'm not, I'm, I'm not trying to really compare Mick Foley to, to Anderson. Don't make don't make the mistake there. I'm just, just saying. I'm glad he won. I thought at first that they were going to let Matt Morgan go on to face Jeff Hardy, but at least it was somebody that I do like. And I do like Ken Anderson. I think he's very good. So that was good. Okay. What do you think, Will? Yeah, I, I was very happy when he won. There's a good and bad to this. The good thing is it was a surprise because the whole night was Bischoff winning the other belt but not really being too much concerned with the world title because he thought this one was going to be a, uh, a, a thing in the bag because of the fact that, hey, Anderson's weak. Let's have him wrestle now. And Jeff Hardy comes out with a cigarette, no wrestling gear. And you would think that this match would have been quick, but it really Wait, wasn't. Wait, isn't that the way he usually wrestles? Um, I Not in the gear he was wearing that night. <laughs> he hasn't but, had wrestling uh, gear for like 13 okay. years. In his normal attire. Is that better? Okay. Okay. So um, the match overall was good. There was there was good drama with the interference. I think the interference helped out a little bit in the match because I don't think it would have been as good uh, with all the people running down. And, you know, Ken Anderson winning, he deserves it. You know, he's the kind of guy I think that could have the belt for a while, help that company out. You know, their ratings went up, so I can't imagine them doing too bad with it. So, you know, we'll see what happens. We'll see in a couple of months, see how his reign goes. 702 Area Code, you're on with Wrestling Roundtable. Name and location, please. Uh, it's Joe from uh, Las Vegas. Ah, how cold is it out there, there in Vegas? <laughs> uh, 70 degrees and sunny. What, was it just uh, cold the week I was uh, there or what? Well, that's because you brought it with you, Eric. That's what. That's the problem. You need to stop <laughs> coming out here, man. Hey, you know what they say, cold, cold hands, warm cold heart. What do you have rain. to say? Uh, I don't want to know about your cold hands. Anywhere near anybody. Anyway, uh, I know you were going to get to Raw, but uh, so I just wanted to bring up uh, Randy Orton and the Miz fighting for the mm-hmm. fight for the title, and where and the uh, the actual big thing is the Royal Rumble, and they they expanded it to forty guys. Just wanted to hear your thoughts on it. Okay, well we are going to be covering that connected with our Raw 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 Raw, raw talk. dude, Raw dude, <laughs> Monday Night Raw. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I guess the big thing is uh, was mentioned before is not Batista, Mason Ryan, and the New Nation. <clears throat> I mean, New Nexus. I didn't know they were for Black Power. But uh, the parallel Nexus storylines: uh, Wade Barrett adding Ezekiel to his group, Punk adding Mason Ryan. So I guess the theme of the week is Nexus adding big jacked up juice guys. This all connects together with the Royal Rumble. But before we get to the Rumble, what are your thoughts on Raw, Will? The last few Raws actually have been very good. I mean, at least the last two weeks have been good. Um, you could definitely see a little bit of change in Raw. Not really so much PG that much. They're throwing a couple little hints in now that they, you know, kind of going a little bit more extreme, which uh, definitely is definitely making the product good. I thought uh, the Raw show last night, I thought uh, Morrison and Dale Bryant had a great match. I thought the um, the Orton and Ziggler was a good match, and I even thought the Cena and the CM Punk match was good. I think that one they should have waited, but uh, for that one, I don't think that should have been on free TV. Uh, but I think I like um, I like where they're going with the new Nexus. I like it a lot. I think it's uh, definitely better that they're they're going with more of a cult feel. 
And, uh, you know, it's definitely working out. And uh, CM Punk is the highlight of WWE right now. I got to tell you, he is really pushing this heel role. You know, we're doing things that, you know, normally you wouldn't see uh, or we haven't seen in a couple of years. Uh, but I like the way it's going. And it's definitely getting me excited for the Rumble that I'm going to. So any fans are going to be involved, and I'll be there if you want to get autographs. <laughs> All right. Well, you mentioned how it was a little – less PG, and uh, I guess that'll connect to the New Generation talk we're going to have in a little bit, but uh, yeah, I'm surprised that they would do the whole Bella Twins want to take Brian Danielson's virginity thing. Yes, uh, uh, Corey would love to do as well, wouldn't you, Corey? Well, yeah. I'm not surprised that they want to take his virginity, I'm just surprised they don't know he's gay. Yeah. Uh, okay. I doubt that. Anyway, Will Brooks, what do you think about the direction WWE's going in with Raw? I don't know, it doesn't really bother me. Like, I think I said before when we were talking about it, they're kind of more PG-13. You know, they, just, they want to be PG, but they're kind of hinting at other stuff to make it like, ooh, what's going on now? Ooh, surprising. Ooh, like this. But before I give it back to you, Eric, I got to say I'm a little pissed at you because you kind of stole my uh, Wade Barrett's Nexus as the Wolfpack joke in the beginning of the show. <laughs> it was the obvious joke to make. Come on. Yes, but damn it, I was going to say it, and you totally started off the show with it, Nick. Uh, Cry remember, dude. Host privilege, what can I say? Ryan from Massachusetts. Hello, Ryan. Hey, it's always great to be back on the show. Raw's been on a hot streak for not even the past few weeks, but since September. It's just been really fun to watch. I mean, it's like Dan O'Brien bringing in the quality matches. Him versus Morrison this week was a little short. CM Punk versus uh, Cena was really great, and I was really glad to see CM Punk pull out the... Uh, Koji Clutch, even though Cole messed it up calling it the Anaconda Vice. Shocking. I really like seeing where they're going with uh, my friends are calling him Batiste 2. You know, number 2. <laughs> uh, I have yet to see him in FCW. I don't know how good he is. Um, yeah, he's big, but I'm hope- but uh, I think of someone on the uh, forum already pointed out, I hope he's big so he can move like Lashley or if we're really lucky, Lesnar. Overall, I'm really liking the direction um, Raw is going. I'm really liking the direction SmackDown is going. And I think anybody's watching uh, NXT anymore, so it doesn't really matter. I think NXT is actually a lot better, too. Well, everyone's talking about the Rumble, and I can't say I'm thrilled about it. I think adding 40 people to the Rumble is just going to lead. I mean, just based on the 21 that have been announced so far, you can see the clear maybe four or five guys who are going to be in there eliminating all the other junk. And, of course, there's going to be surprises like, I don't know, maybe Triple H or Amazing Kong or some fucking legends or some shit that are going to waddle out there. But you can just see the direction where it's going. Not that that it won't necessarily be fun, but I I think uh, 30 was the good way to stick with it. And I'm just not looking forward to not – Miz and Morrison, like we were predicting last time. I mean, silly us. WWE rarely has patience for anything in the past 10 years, and we all thought from the TLC pay-per-view that Morrison being number one contender would probably just lead to the natural idea of the two former tag champions wrestling for the title at the Rumble. It's one of the big shows of the year. It seemed to make sense, but they did it on the first Raw of the year instead, and now it's going to be Orton and Miz again. So, how do you think the Rumble that you're going to attend is shaping up, Will? Well, last night helped a lot, but then I think Miz, uh, you know, he shows like a very serious, psychotic side of himself when he was talking, you know, when he attacked Orton. The Rumble is going to be good because of the Rumble. The other matches are all fillers. I don't care if it's a WWE title. I mean, we don't see a title change on the Royal Rumble that often. And the match isn't as important, I think, because it's not the first time. If it was the first time, I think I would have cared. But it's pretty obvious Miz is going to WrestleMania with the belt. And, uh, you know. Not according to our poll. I could care less about that poll. All right? Mm -hmm. I'm I'm Will. I'm TLD. I'm telling you, he's going to WrestleMania with the belt. The feud's good, but I think this should end it. I think Orton might try to sneak himself into the Royal Rumble itself. I mean, we have 40 spots to fill. He might hurt somebody to get in it. So I I won't be surprised if Randy Orton gets a little uh, shot into the Rumble. Yeah, I don't like the 40 guys in a Rumble match either. I mean, I really feel like it's going to be a ploy to make somebody look better than they are. 
you know, like, oh, this guy uh, survived 35 guys, and that's the record, or, you know, it's going to be, like, something just to make a guy look better. I agree. I, I think I was a little pissed off because I think Nance and Morrison was, would have been a great feud. They had a great match on Raw, and I think they could have led into a really good um, WrestleMania. But, mm-hmm. obviously, you're going to give it to Cena. But, I mean, but with the way the Rumble is so being, like, said, the way they're leading to it, I really got to think they're going to they're let Alfonso Del Rio win because they're giving him so much heat right now. That it just makes me think that they're gonna they're gonna let him win. Mm-hmm. Jason from Brooklyn, New York. Hello, Jason. Hey, Eric. How you doing? Doing okay. I want to know what's on your mind, Jason Murdoch. Related yeah. to Dick? Nah, <laughs> nah. He's with a Trevor. He's with a K. He's with an H. <laughs> nah. But yeah, um, right. they said the reason why they added forty to the rumble is because there was no momentum. Going into the pay per view, I'm like, no dick. <laughs> like, of course it isn't. When they built, when they built Benoit, or they built Orton, like, there's, you don't have no idea unless you say, okay, Triple H is going to come back and win. That's what most people have been saying since, for like almost a year now, since he, got, since he's been on the injury list. And they could be a good thing, or say if they do let Miz carry the belt to WrestleMania, and Morrison happens to win the Royal Rumble. Then it'll be a little special. Okay. You know, I, I, I'll give it that. Because WWE, I don't know if they have that much faith in Morrison to uh, give him WrestleMania. They might because he's, he's you know, he he brings in the ratings. But I don't know if as far as a match of that, you know, as far as a main event size that magnitude, they may fuck him over. They may fuck him over, which would be unfortunate because he'll be a new face at WrestleMania. So, as far as the Rumble is concerned, the Rumbles itself, I'm looking to see what Rey Mysterio do because he had a, he had stellar performance at the Rumble. Like I said, my, my wet dream is hearing Savage, Savage come out and throw Triple H. <laughs> <laughs> keep, you're going to have to keep wet dreaming there. But I think the 40 people is just indicative of the way WWE's been approaching pay-per-view in the past couple of years, because the first year they tried all these gimmick pay-per-views, switching the standard morbidly titled shows like Armageddon and Judgment Day to more the theme pay-per-views of submissions and four-ways and cage matches and TLCs and all that sort of shit. And once the first year of that did well, and the second year not so much... Uh, I guess they're just looking to up the ante, and Rumble generally always does well, I would think. I mean, it's one of the pay-per-views everyone always looks forward to anyway, but I guess they felt they needed to do a little more this year. But we're going to backtrack a little bit here, because on our season finale, show number 46, one of the things we covered was a topic that you voted on the fans, and you wanted us to talk about the WWF's new generation time period, which we did, and wanted to expand on that a little bit. First of all, I wanted to make a correction. There's some embarrassments here and there on the show. I mean, we try and prepare for the show and have our stuff down, but every once in a while there's a slip-up. We're only human. And like the other show when we were constantly referring to Yushin Okami in his fight with Nate Marquardt as Akiyama, (laughs) no one noticed. And we were talking the whole time and just calling him Akiyama by mistake. Funny enough, that's who Marquardt is fighting next, but... Stuff like that happens here and there. And on this show, I said that Marty Jannetty awesome bombed Chris Candido at SummerSlam 96. And one of our viewers on YouTube helpfully pointed out that that was actually King of the Ring 96. So making that correction right there. And incidentally, that match with Body Donna's and the new Rockers was pretty fucking awesome. But uh, that's a funny thing about that time period, too. Tag Division was generally relegated to a few people, much like the TLC feuds of a few years later between uh, Dudley's, Edge and Christian, and Hardy's, and of course you had two cool in the tag division here and there as well, and a few other thrown-together sort of teams, but back then it was pretty much smoking guns, Body Donna's, Godwin's, and a few other teams mixed in once in a while, and as goofy as the gimmicks were, they were actually pretty good matches uh, if you actually watch them. One of the things Rodney mentioned on the show was that when I brought up how Ultimate Warrior's run sucked in 96, for lack of a better word, I just felt that he 
didn't really fit in anywhere. Uh, it's, it seemed as if he was a relic when they were concentrating, not just at the time, but with, with Shawn Michaels' title reign, but in the years before with Brett and Owen over the title. He could not keep up with them as far as work rate, quote-unquote, uh, technical wrestling-wise or high-flying. And uh, he was put in with gold dust and Lawler and just weird sort of things. And Rodney said that there were better matchups they could have done. And I, if he was around, I'd ask him what those could have been. I mean, could, did he really think that uh, Brett and Michaels or whoever would have been able to bring him to watchable matches or not? Um, well, I'll leave that up to you. Someone also mentioned that they thought that one of the problems with the time period was that WWE kept hedging their bets on the top guys. I would say notoriously, but I don't think a lot of people know about it, but it's just my feeling that they never quite had faith in Bret Hart. I've made that case on the show. It seemed as if they always were trying to go with somebody else. When he was champion the first time, they switched it back to Hogan and Yokozuna sort of guys, and then they wanted to push the Lugers, and then Shawn Michaels had his turn, and a lot of Bret Hart fans were upset about that, unbelievably to me, because I felt it was Shawn Michaels' time, but they took the belt off of Michaels, too, eventually, and uh, actually, he would have lost it a lot sooner to Vader at SummerSlam if he hadn't gotten his way, but uh it just seemed like they didn't stick with somebody when at least their point on YouTube was that Bret Hart should have been the guy they stuck with all along. So that's uh, something to think about, but... um. We also talked about the best and worst matches, moments, and overall shows. So uh, we can get some of your thoughts on that or just the time period in general. So uh, you were on for a little bit, Will Vafides, but uh, do you have any more further thoughts on WWF's new generation time period at the time? Keep in mind it was PG. I was in the age group that the kids are in now, right. where they're enjoying the content now. Yeah, I still watch it, though. You know, so, I mean, there was something about that era that still drew me in. I don't mm-hmm. know if it was part of the wrestling or, but there were some feuds that were really good. Like, the one that stood out to me the whole time was Jerry Lawler, Bret Hart feud. You mm-hmm. know, as much as those guys didn't really wrestle in the ring a lot, they would trash each other at other points. Uh, they were coming out with new concepts, like the King of the Rings started up again, you know, this time in pay-per-view form. So that was brand, that was another brand new concept, and he and we started doing more pay per views. You know, I, I think things were changing based on that. You know, we we were able to follow the storylines because I remember back in the day I couldn't really watch Raw. I couldn't really, you know, watch a lot of things. So like I would go from pay per view to pay per view, not knowing what the feud was about. And I think that that time period you started seeing the feuds almost every week build. And I think that that's what, to me, was really good, is that you could see the build throughout the entire couple of months. And, yeah, they had some stupid things going on, but the wrestling was still very good. The characters, I think, were sellable, I would say. I think I, I, like you could believe in them. Like, that's who they really are. And um, Well, you know, not and the again, goons and the T.L. Hoppers. No, no, no. Here. Not those, like, even, like, Doink was believable. Like, you could even believe that. You know, I mean, if that gimmick is still going around in these shows today, something obviously must have caught someone's eye because it still works. Or they're desperate. So, yeah, well, uh, still, they might be desperate, but it still works. It's, uh, you know, so, again, I think that it was um, a very good time fer- period for us to be kids. I think that that would still work today, you know, and I really enjoyed it, you know, you know, the, the free-for-alls, the beginning of the pay-per-view. It was always fun to watch. Todd Pettengill was going off, selling this pay-per-view like crazy every single week. You know, it, it was great. It was a great time. And um, I never watched WCW. I thought, you know, I wasn't really a WCW fan. You know, the new generation I thought was great because I think it got us, us kids really involved in the product. They made it like, you know, the kids are as much the product as the wrestlers are. Well, let me try to complement what you're saying, I think, because I had a discussion this weekend with somebody about this whole PG thing and why wrestling isn't particularly popular, at least in, as a mainstream 
as the mainstream goes with people our age anymore. A lot of us have moved on to mixed martial arts. A lot of us just don't watch wrestling anymore. Some of us have stuck with it, like you and several other people, but clearly not on the level as the Hogan run in the 80s with rock and wrestling or the Austin run with attitude. And what would get wrestling back to that level? And the person I was talking with thought that a lot of these kids that WWE is catering towards now are going to grow up eventually in this more violence and sex themed sort of programming are going to, is going to come back. And I don't think that's necessarily a given, uh, but that's another thing. What I want to relate it to is everyone re- our age generally rips on the PG theme that they've adopted in the past couple of years. Now, granted they did adopt it before Linda McMahon ran for Senate, but it kind of, it, well, not kind of. It, I think it did get out of control with Linda McMahon running for Senate to the point where you order 24-7 and you watch a Raw from back then in 1996 or 1997 and they gray, black and white, the blood. Give me a fucking break. When I download a primetime wrestling I watched when I was 10 years old and get a warning that this is programming intended for mature viewers or adult viewers, get the fuck out of there. It's King Kong Bundy, you dick. But anyway, Eric Bischoff in his book, The Controversy Creates Cash Book, from and it's been a couple of years since I read it, but from what I remember, he, he yeah, it was good and, and interesting, but I seem to remember that he kind of pinned WCW's downfall creatively on AOL's standards and practices because they couldn't do the edgy, raunchy stuff that WF was doing to compete, and I think that's such a weak excuse for a bankrupt creative team. And I'll give you three perfect examples. In 1998, WCW's most profitable year ever and the year after the first quarter or so that they lost ground to WF forever – they, I believe, won Nitro from one night then on, and they definitely at least won a quarter with these segments I'm going to mention. But they won with Goldberg beating Hogan. They yeah, won with Flair's comeback in September 98 with the mm-hmm. Horseman reunion, and they won with Warriors' debut. And not one of those segments has a beer can, a thong, or a chair shot with a blade job. Not one of them has anything to do with sex or violence, and that's because they are characters. And I think that's the big difference between then and now. It's almost tangible, but I believe ever since they adopted the writers or writing team of ex-Hollywood goofballs and comic book nerds format that Stephanie McMahon adopted when she took over to try and get credibility in the real world in about 2000 or so that they've run with ever since – I think it's such an obvious fucking difference how formulated they are, how not as willing to take risks they are, how restricted, how restrictive they are of what the wrestlers do and say. Obviously, everyone's been complaining for years, wrestlers and fans alike, about how the wrestlers don't have as much freedom anymore. And clearly, the level of, let's say, promo talent is drawn between the Roddy Pipers and Michael Hayes of the world and the homogenized cookie cutter developmental guys that are brought up reading line by line with no harder feeling. And the difference back then, I mean, of course there's tons of wrestle crap stuff, which we covered on the show and there's Isaac Yankum and the clowns and the garbage men and all that dumb shit. And that cost them. However, on top, at least even with the goofy guys like uh, Body Donnas and Rockers, I mentioned having an awesome uh, match at King of the Ring 96. You had guys like Bret Hart, Shawn Michaels, Owen Hart, tearing it up, Razor Ramon, having Diesel. awesome matches. Yep. It's the character development. There's no characters anymore. I, I mean, if you go to a Ring of Honor, a TNA, a WWE, they are all exactly the same. You might find one or two that may be different but they're all the same. Mm -hmm. No one has a different look. People who wear the same color tights, that to me is like, okay, well, Orton wears the same tights as Ted DiBiase. What's the difference? They have black boots and they have black, you know, they're wearing black underwear trunks. So what's different about that? Well, look at this. Remember Crush? Remember Doink the Clown? 
Remember IRS? Remember Hulk Hogan? Remember Bret Hart? What do you find the difference in all that? All their gear is totally different. That to me is, is just as important, you know, that they have different gear. Because then I can't tell the difference. If you put, if you turn people around in WWE right now and you tell them to name the people without looking at their face, how? I guarantee you, you'll probably get mo- a lot of them wrong because yeah. you can't tell the difference between the two. So that's why in WWE or WF back in the day, New Generation era, everybody looked 100% different. No one looked the same. Well, let me compare you know? in, in terms of writing. I mean, granted the wrestlers – had awesome matches. They were allowed to back then. That's great. But just in terms of the writing, I mentioned the lack of patience before with the Ms. Morrison not happening at the Rumble thing. Well, look at the Bret Hart Owen Hart feud unraveling over the entire yep. course of 1994, intersecting with the great Bob Backlund heel character. He was having an incredible comeback, and that all intersected together, starting actually really in November 93. 93 but building, yep. Yeah, building up to. The next year, a year later and beyond. Yep. It's just it's a drastic difference. But uh, let's get uh, the thoughts of Will Brooks. Uh, any more thoughts on the WWF's new generation time period? I look back at it with a fond memory. Like, I had fun watching it. I was still, you know, I got to remember, you guys are a little bit older than me. I was like, you know, in 92, I was only seven years old. So, in 92, 93, 94, 95, and 96, those years of the uh, new generation, I look back on fond memories because it was still part of my childhood, but I was still growing up, so I still, I, I fell in love with Bret Hart, Shawn Michaels, and the athleticism, but I still was okay with stupid gimmicky stuff, like, you know, Doink and Crush and Duke the Jumps of Josie and all those guys. So it was, for me, it was like that happy medium, and then, of course, you know, then as I got hit my teenage years, there came the attitude there. And I was just as I was going into puberty, so it really was like perfect timing for me for all of these things. Mm-hmm. But I like the new generation. I had a lot of fun watching it. Uh, yeah, there was some stuff I would have changed, but you know, that's how that's because hindsight one for twenty twenty. You know, we talked about some of the best and worst matches, moments, and overall shows. So, uh, without any specific restrictions, what's on your mind, Will Brooks? Do you have any that you'd like to get off your chest as far as that goes? I love Bret Hart versus Bam Bam Bigelow, King of the Ring Finals. That's, that's one of the best matches above both of the career, really. I think Bret Hart really proved that he was the MVP of the WWF back then because I think he even mentioned it in his book that he was really out to prove that because they had taken the belt off him and done the Hogan-Yokozuna thing instead, and he kind of resented that, rightfully so. And he went out and had an incredible night. Awesome opener with Razor. In the middle with Mr. Perfect, which some people think was better than their 91 match, no less. And then no, the see. match then the match with Bigelow in the finals. Incredible Even performance the all night by Bret Hart. Perfect match was great. Even the promo going into the Perfect match was great when they argued about whose dad was tougher. Uh-huh. Yeah, yep. that was great. So he even showed he could, st- he could still have a good interview, too. Mm-hmm. So Someone on YouTube... Someone on YouTube mentioned that Mabel and Yokozuna from October 95's In Your House was one of the worst matches, and that show was headlined by Diesel and the newly heel-turned British Bulldog. I don't think, aside from Goldust's debut against Marty Jannetty, there was a lot of good going on in that show. But uh, a lot of people were bringing up... One second, um, the British Bulldog was also a very underrated talent from back then, too, because he was like... The one guy who faced all the like the face champions. He faced Bret Hart. He faced Shawn Michaels. He faced Diesel. Yeah, he faced all those like the top guys of his, like of that too, uh, that time too, and made them look good in the, in the main event matches. So mm-hmm. I think he 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 deserves a little more he deserves a little more credit for that for being great in that era as well. A lot of people mentioned the Shawn Michaels Owen Hart match from February 1996s in your house as a I guess a forgotten gem. I mentioned before that I was going to bring up Jeff Jarrett. I really enjoyed uh, Jeff Jarrett's mid-card heel run for the Intercontinental title and his matches against Reza Ramon in 1995. Uh, what do you think, Will Valdez? Do you have any that you'd like to bring up for best and worst matches, moments, and overall shows? It was WrestleMania 10 because I was there, and as a kid, watching that whole show from top to bottom, it was just an amazing night for me. That, to me, will always stick out. It's one of my top five memories of my whole, you know, of, me, of wrestling of anything that I've ever watched. Uh, so that, to me, stands out. And the funny thing was, I, I, I just looked back on the tape, and Owen Hart actually flips on Bret Hart 
at the end of his match after he beat him. I just realized that he did that. I was like, well, I didn't even see that. Well, that stood uh, out a lot watch. to me watching at home in pay-per-view in 1994. Yeah, So, uh, but that was pretty funny. But um, that, to me, stood out. The diesel um, Bret Hart match at Survivor Series 1995, that one was a very good match. Not uh, only was it a very good match, I think it was the best match they had in the yeah, few matches yeah. that they had on pay-per-view. I think I'm in yeah. the minority there, but I think that was a great no, fight. No, no. I think, oh, I you know, I think every, every match that they've had actually was very good, especially for a guy that's very tall. Compared to a technician, you know, you know, you wonder how kind of a, how good of a match it could be. Kevin Nash, you know, again, great talent. I always love Kevin Nash, you know, and I think As you that should. He does, yeah, I mean, he's a great talent, and I don't care of all the bull crap he got about WCW and all that. You know, he's a good talent. All those guys meshed well. It was just a great era. Razor Ramon, you know, running with the Intercontinental Title was one of my favorite things. Razor to me was like a, you know. The first heel that ever got over as a as a good guy, that was like he's the first guy. I can't remember another person doing it. So many great moments. It's hard to say. Well, I think the Bret Hart Diesel match from Survivor Series '95 I liked a lot because when you think of the dynamic of the big man versus little man, and the psychology is usually the big man beats the shit out of the little man. Well, Bret Hart, of course, had built his character and reputation on the fact that he was a smart wrestler, a good technical wrestler. Mm -hmm. And in this sense, it was really cool. It kind of reminds me of the Austin Aries-Samoa Joe match from Final Battle oh four years later, but the little man took an aggressive turn. He went for it instead of being the guy running away from it. I guess kind of like a heel would in a way, but uh, Bret Hart was aggressive in that match, and uh, it was yes, really cool, especially yeah. when he used the cable to take out the the vertical position from Diesel and get him on his back where he should be and went after the legs. It was really cool. Great psychology, as usual, with what, Bret Hart matches. And, what's good, and what was good about Bret was the possum that he would play uh, because mm-hmm. he would always speak, and that's how he beat Diesel in that pay-per-view. He did it with a roll-up. I mean, yep. did, I mean, honestly, did you see a roll-up ending that match? I mean, I didn't. And then Diesel got so pissed off because he lost that way that he just started, you know, destroying Brett. You know, but it was, um, again, that was one of my favorite matches, I think. And the wild card match, too, was actually another one. That whole, that whole show was pretty good, actually, the whole Survivor Series 95. That was a pretty cool concept, and I'm shocked that they haven't done it since. I thought it was a good idea, and they just never went anywhere with it, I guess. But uh, we are running out of time, unfortunately. You want to talk more about the WS New Generation or anything else that we talked about on the show, please sign up for our message board at WrestlingGroundTable.com. Next time, we will be talking about Strike Force Diaz versus Cyborg, and that would be <clears throat> Nick Diaz. Not Nate, Rodney. We will be also talking about the Royal Rumble. We, I guess, somewhat previewed it tonight. We'll see how it plays out. We'll also be doing the best and worst debuts and returns for mixed martial arts, an exclusive topic for here on Roundtable Radio. And we followed up on the first half of our season finale here tonight. We'll be following up on the second half. The second half was submission round four, the Q&A. So we will be getting some questions that didn't make the air and some follow-up on questions that did. So more Q&A from Submission Round 4 when we come back in a couple weeks. And please stay tuned on WrestlingRoundTable.com. Some news coming up soon on our new season, Season 4. What are the topics? Well, sign up for the newsletter, and maybe you'll find out. And don't forget to shop at our stores. Get Pro Wrestling Respect DVDs. Support the Wrestling Roundtable by wearing the shirt. And telling all your friends, share, comment, rate, and subscribe wherever you're listening to us. So for the panel of Rodney LeCant, Will Brooks, Will Vapides, and all the callers, thank you very much. I'm the host, Eric Santamaria. Thank you, and join us in a couple weeks. 